Hello and welcome to this week's Cats Whiskers TV podcast. My name is John O'Bullard. On this week's show, we've got an interview coming up with former Panthers defenceman Brock Wilson, and we'll also be talking to Neil the coach Russell from A View from the Bridge a little later as we look ahead to Panthers Sunday game against the Belfast Giants. However, first we're going to look back at last weekend, games against the Sheffield Steelers and the Coventry Blaze, and joining me as always is Mr. Aaron Lord. Good evening, Jonathan. Good evening. How are you? I'm not too bad, thank you. Yeah, how are you? Yeah, not bad. Not bad at all. So, Good shall food. we Shall we um, get on to Sheffield first? Yeah, why not? Let's get stuck into it. Yeah. Okay, so Steelers against the Panthers. A 3-2 victory for the Sheffield Steelers in regulation time. Steelers taking a 2-0 lead before Panthers pulled goals back. And then Robert Dowd scored the winner with a few minutes to go for the 3-2 victory. Now, I feel personally that Sheffield overall completely deserved the win because they were by far the better team on the night. Yep, I uh, fully agree with you. It's... um... It wasn't a great night from my point of view for the Panthers. We looked disjointed at times. I felt very sloppy in the amount of turnovers that we gave away. I think uh, that was a big thing for me, was the number of turnovers that we was giving up on Saturday mm-hmm. night. I mean, it was getting, personally, I thought, beyond a joke. It was like we couldn't string a pass together. And the thing that annoyed me most about it was how good we'd been the previous weekend against Hull and Coventry, where we played really, really well. And yeah. then to to sort of, it was almost back to square one on Saturday night. Kind of went there with, you know, feeling quite positive And I thought we'd actually see good, solid road performance by the Panthers. And for me, I didn't really see that. And the coach was quite happy with, with, certain aspects of how his team played but for me it, it it wasn't great and we didn't deserve to win you know full credit to Sheffield um, they looked like they kind of wanted the puck more they looked like they they were up for the game more than us um, I must say I was very impressed with Forney from the Steelers every time he got the puck he looked dangerous he looked to to you know to pretty much go straight to net and and put Modic under pressure but you know, you have to give a little bit of credit to the Panthers. We we tied it back to two two, very scrappy goals. You know, hey, they when all you're count. not, yeah, well, exactly. You know, when you're not playing well, it, it kind of put us into the the position where we might have been able to get something from the game. Uh, and to be fair, we very very nearly did. I mean, if you think about it, uh, after Sheffield had taken the lead, David Clark hit the crossbar on the power play couple of inches lower and that would have gone in and then yeah. I suppose one of the one of the best saves I've seen this season from Frank Doyle from yeah. Robert Lakovic where where he went upstairs and just Doyle somehow got his pad to it it was a phenomenal save yep yeah, well I mean Doyle has, has has got that in his locker hasn't he now he can he can do those saves and he looked to be fair Doyle looked pretty solid all night didn't he he didn't yeah. really look like he was going to you know let in too many goals and it would take something special from the Panthers um, to 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 get the win there but you know I also felt a little bit that we lacked a little bit of leadership on the ice if I'm honest mm. you know you 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 you're against the Steelers I just felt that after the first period you could see that we weren't playing great and I felt it kind of needed a bit of something on the ice to kind of kickstart us on the night. And I felt that we didn't really see that. Mm. You know, and that's disappointing because of late, I, I think we've seen that leadership. And don't know whether you can just notch it as a bad night at the office, but that's that's being quite meek and mild about it. But it, it, it was a night that just wasn't good from our point of view no it, it wasn't and I, I it's like i said i've already pointed out about the, the turnovers which really really annoyed me which was continually giving sheffield possession and and kept them totally on the front foot for the, the vast majority of the game but also you're right i think there's no one really prepared to take the game by the scruff of the neck and really you know go for it and if if one thing that it did highlight it was probably our, our lack of goal scorer at the minute and 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 mm. goals we have been struggling with as as we've we've known yeah um i mean obviously sunday and tuesday night were a lot better and we'll come back on to them but i think if anything we we just 
apart from the two scrappy goals we scored, mm-hmm. you know, we didn't create an awful lot in front of Frank Doyle's goal. No, I'd I'd fully agree with you to be honest. And I don't really know what more you could say about that. Yeah, I I mean, yes, I thought on occasions we did some nice we did some nice plays, but it never kind of mustered an opportunity or a clear cut chance. We've talked about two obviously Clark is where he hit the bar in the third period and we've talked about the Laco shot which Doyle somehow managed to save, but Apart from that, and I mean, I know it's Wednesday night now and it was the game was on Saturday, but I can't really remember another clear-cut chance. I can't either. You know, all. and that, that possibly tells you the story. We talk about this on re- on a regular basis and people will, you know, be screaming at us and everything like that. But it kind of highlights that when we don't score goals, we're putting a lot of pressure on our D mm. and on Modig. Mm. You know, and and K Wallif when he comes back. For me, RD has been fantastic pretty much all season. And if we saw the scoring level of the Panthers that we've seen in the past, then RD would look even more fantastic. But on a on a tight game like like Saturday was, and we didn't create that many clear cut chances, it's hard to get the two points. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, big talking point from that match was Robert Dowd getting a 2 plus 10 for a check into the head on Sam Oakford. Sam Oakford hasn't played since that incident. Now, we've seen it on slow motion video thanks to the the Steelers highlights. I've got to say, I think Robert Dowd dodged a bullet and I think he should have been banned. I'm not going to disagree with you. And, you know, looking at a few things today, I, I watched the highlights back and forth, back and forth, you know, real-time, slow motion, which obviously the Steelers provide with their highlights. And I looked at the rule for checking to the head or neck, which is rule 124. In the WIHF rule book. This is correct. (laughs) Now, I'm just going to say a few things to you, Jono, and I'd like to get your opinion on these on these, okay? He so, plays for Sheffield, you should have been banned there, there's my opinion. <laughs> yeah. No, come on, we're trying to do this professional now. Jono. Okay, mate, yeah. Um, so, there is no such thing as a clean hit to the head. Whether accidental or intentional, every direct hit to the head or neck of an opponent will be penalised. Fair enough, he got penalised. So, you know, cross that one off. Then what can he get? So, a player who directs a check to the head or neck of an opponent will be assessed one of three penalties, basically. So, a minor penalty and a misconduct penalty, which is obviously what Robert Dowd got. A major penalty and automatic game misconduct penalty or a match penalty. Okay, so, as I say, he got the most lenient of penalties. Yeah. But he did get penalised for it. But then this is the one that really brings something to me and, and... and for me, justifies why I say he got away with it lightly. Hmm. So, a player who injures or recklessly endangers an opponent as a result of checking to the head or neck will be assessed a match penalty. Which is what happened. Now, as you just mentioned, Oakford hasn't played since. That's why I say Dowd should not have played any further in that game. You hear Simsy basically on the on the highlights say that you know, he didn't even think it was a two-minute penalty. And I believe you've seen forums, you know, from Steelers fans as well, haven't you? Saying exactly the same thing, yeah. I'm trying to look at this not from a purely Panthers' eyes. I'm looking at rule 124. Mm. And for me, there's enough there to say that Dowd got lucky with a 2 plus 10. Because for me as well, Dowd's eyes are fully focused on Oakford. You know, he turns. So basically, Dowd is facing the puck. He turns, sees Oakwood, Oakford coming in. And his top of the, sh- uh, you know, his, the top of his shoulder makes contact. With it, 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 pretty much square in the face. The, yeah, square in the face. the jaw, pretty yeah. much. And what I would ask is, why does Dowd need to make that hit so high? He was really in control of that puck. There were, Oakford wasn't really going to do much apart from just try and you know poke the puck away from him. But Dowd was pretty much in control of that. So always remember, always that. remember though, we have seen it in super slow motion, and we've seen it in game speed. We've seen it in sl- super slow motion, and obviously that is going to make it appear worse. 
Oh, yeah, I, I get that. So, you know, you have to give credit to the refs in the first place because they gave him one of the three options that they did with checking to the head. What a question I would ask as well is, you, you know, they're not going to know that Oakford might not play any more of that game. You no. know, they might not know that he's got concussion or, or a head injury or anything like that. So, you know, you have to take that into account. But why was that not reviewed? Why is that not picked up? Because we've seen in previous, you know, games with other teams that when a player has been at the end of a check into the head and has concussion, the person that did the penalty gets banned. Yeah, you know, I, I, t- I totally agree. And that, and that's, uh, I think, why uh, I've certainly seen from a lot of Panthers fans and other fans as well, to be fair, saying, well, well why has, has Dops not reviewed that? Because an injury was caused on the play. And I, I believe, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that any any incident that causes an injury on the play will be reviewed by Dops. Yeah, that's my knowledge. I mean, like like you say, I'm not 100%, but that's my knowledge. So if it's been reviewed, why has he not been banned? Because as you've quoted directly there from the rule book, it should be a match penalty because there was an injury on the play. Well, th- these are the questions that you don't know, do you? Because you don't hear anything, you don't hear everything from, you know, we don't even know whether that did get reviewed. Whether no, we don't, and, and that's you know, the thing. Is that it? something that the Panthers has has to ask for, and the Panthers haven't? Which you know you have to say fair enough. If the Panthers haven't asked for it, Dowd isn't going to get banned, is he? So, or at least even the play isn't going to get reviewed. But I feel that he got away lightly, and you know I'll say I Dowd for me has has done this before. He's he's been called for checking to the head before. I'm not saying that. Dowd is dirty player and does this on intentionally, etc. I don't even think he did it intentionally, but he did it. I just, I just think he got and it. And it clearly says in the rule book because I, I had a look, at, I had a look myself on on Monday, and it says it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if it's accidental or not. You know, no. the, the player is in control, so there's no such thing as an accidental uh, check to the head as far as the rule book is concerned. No, exactly. However, I will say, um, I, I went to get a neutral opinion, so I contacted um, Paddy Smith from A View from the Bridge, and I said, yeah. said to him, have a look at it, let me know what you think, and he actually agrees it should have been a 2 plus 10. He thinks that there's no call for supplementary. He, he says he needs a closer shot to be certain, but given yeah. the time that Dowd had to turn and his initial movement to protect the puck on the boards, if there was contact to the head, it would have been accidental. Oaks, Oakford comes in with head high and then dips to reach for the puck. That's why at full speed it looks okay for me, but poor slowed down. So well, that's Paddy's uh, opinion, and I thought I think f- to get it's it's fair that we get sort of a neutral opinion as well because it it could be regarded that obviously we're Panthers fans, so we might be showing bias. This is weird because this is how me and you think. Because I asked the coach mm. from a, a view from the bridge, and he he pretty much couldn't make up his mind. One minute he said that it was you know a fair call, he got what he should, and then the other you know he basically puts mm, interesting one. I'm semi on the fence. Dowd looks at the player as he's coming in, but I'm not sure it was an intentional headshot. And then, you know, he comes back later saying, lucky to not get a game or further ban. And then he comes back again and says, two plus ten, the right call. So it's obviously one for discussion. Mm. Mm. But let's say it didn't make, apart from the fact that he scored the winning goal, but (laughs) I, I I I don't really think, you know, we didn't deserve to win on the night. No, season. we we didn't. We deserve to get the two points. But at the but, same time, you can play badly and win. <laughs> yeah, you can do, you can. And some people say incidents like that will make a difference. Dowd is a good player for them. Mm. You know, he's he's the golden child of the Sheffield Steelers. So you know, <laughs> Good play, not... a bit overrated in my opinion, but, you know, here you go. But... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, shall we move on to Sunday? Yeah, why not? I think we should. Um, so, Coventry on Sunday. You went to the Sky Dome. I watched the webcast. I still thought too many turnovers throughout the whole game, if I'm honest. And obviously, Blaze, very short bench. And I, despite that, I thought they gave a very good account of themselves, Coventry Blaze. And I thought it was a really good game, actually. Yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, Sunday. Far more than I did on Saturday and that's not due to due to the results you know even before when warm up was on and and during the Coventry Blaze pre-game ritual that they do and 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 their intro I thought that was fantastic I think they've really worked that well and 
and gets the Sky Dome into a good place because I was buzzing for the game. And that's coming back off the trip to Sheffield. So, yeah, I thought it was a, it was an all right game for me. It was never going to be a barnstormer, let's be honest. You know, after Saturday's result and the performance, it was possibly more about getting the two points and rescuing something from the weekend. But I thought we looked more fluid overall. Mm. You know, still not fantastic, still not best that we could play and has played. But I thought it was an improvement on Saturday. Mm. And I would say, though, the Blaze, you know, like you say, they really did give a good account of themselves. They were short benched. You know, so were we, but they were more than us. But that just shows you that, pe- you know, when people talk about being short benched and stuff like that, it doesn't automatically mean that you're going to lose the game. Some standout performances for me on on the night. I thought Max Perron had an excellent game. I also thought Jonathan Boxhill was everywhere uh, when he was on the ice. He was just absolutely non-stop, just complete 100% commitment and and scored a very, very good shorthanded goal as well. Uh, And also, I thought Chris Lawrence played very, very well and scored two excellent goals to win the game for us. The shorthanded goal that we scored, first of all, it was good play by Landry two on one and then Bo- Boxy just uh, obviously we were right behind the goal where, where where the away fans sit and it was beautifully finished um, and then Lawrence I fully agree I thought his two goals were were of good quality you know he, he's he's done that before in, the, in this season he's also missed a few from that kind of area he can put them away mm. Lawrence can put them away I do think his penalty shot was dire well, yeah, but to be fair, he tried that in the penalty shootout a couple of weeks ago and scored exactly the same move. Yeah. I mean, for me, I'm not one. I'm not a fan of this. You you skating fast and then you slow right down, and you're basically waiting for the netminder to make the first move, and you and you slot it home there. Lawrence can take a far better penalty shot than what I can take, and you have to say, yeah, he did pop one away the other the other week, but I just thought at the time it was quite a crucial time as well where it would have been good to get the goal, but hey, we we got the result in the end, but one thing that I would like to say is I, I, th- I think we saw the best power play goal of the season so far that night, and that was from the Coventry Blaze. Their second goal oh, was... Oh, one from Gertsen. Yeah, from Gertz. Absolute it, beauty, it was yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic puck movement, the, the off the puck movement as well. It was It was the way he know, sort of pulled quality. away and got himself free that the and then the pass found him and he, he couldn't miss, really. But it was it was it was it was great play. It was it was a great pass to find him, but great play by Gertz and himself to actually pull himself into that position. And to be fair, Chris Lawrence's goals both of the goals that he scored were actually quite similar where he actually got himself yeah. into that position on the back post uh, and uh, he made it easy for himself he couldn't miss it's typical kind of power play isn't it that you're looking to that that back post and you're looking eight times out of ten you wouldn't miss would you really because yeah. obviously where the netminder's positioned it, it kind of leaves a nice gap there but I just thought the way they took it behind the net and then the pass and then you know the movement off the puck from Gertsen as well I just thought that was you know that was possibly the best goal of the night so you know fair play to the Blaze mm. they've got they've got weapons as we discussed with Owen you know on the on the previous um podcast you know they have got uh, they have got weapons and I think it's you know we'll see what happens when their when their new coach comes in but it was a good response from the Panthers after after a disappointing Saturday to go to another rival, get the two points, and two points from four. It, it, it's obviously not perfect, but in the grand scheme of things, it could have been a lot worse. Hmm. Okay. Some other results from the weekend. Edinburgh with another four-point weekend. About four wins on the trot for them now which sees them goes up, go up to seventh in the table, and that's a real surprise. I mean, it is, you know, I mean, it just shows you, I think I said this on last week's, but a bit of momentum, a bit of confidence mm. back in the team. I mean, you look at the standings, they're seventh, they've got a game in hand on Coventry, and they're on the same amount of points. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean that, just, that just shows you that, you know, we talk about how, how tight the league is at the top, but if you also look at the battles at the bottom, you know, they're... It's they're, just as tight. It's, it is, and it just shows you that if you get a bit of a run together, you get a bit of confidence, and it kind of builds from there, doesn't it? And please for the Cats, because every season they're kind of, not written off, but people take them very lightly. Hmm. And 
they're proving people wrong at the moment and I think that's good for good for their conference it's good for the league and you know people will be going to to Edinburgh you know not sort of guaranteed of the points and that's kind of what you want mm. especially especially our rivals <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, of course, they beat Dundee to game. Um, Dundee are looking adrift at the bottom now, eleven points, mm. and just becalmed there uh, after twenty three games. So they they are not looking good at all. And and after last season where they did so well, and I think after the roster they signed this season, it's just all going wrong for the Dundee Stars at the minute. Players are leaving, aren't they? Did they overachieve last last season? Um, and that's reflecting bad on this season, but. It's kind of, like you say, they are adrift, seven points. Also played a lot more than the people are, you know, above them. But it, I, I, I kind of look at that and think it's it's a long, going to be a long season for the Stars. Mm. Um, but, you know, if you want to look at the positive side of it, look how Edinburgh's kind of pulled themselves back into contention. They're, if they can, if, if, if the Stars can get a few runs on the board, a few wins... You never know, you know. I mean, there's still a lot, a long, long way to go, but at the moment, it's kind of looking tough for them, isn't it? Mm, it is indeed. Uh, we'll talk about the Cardiff Coventry weekend with the coach a little later, but of course, two victories for Coventry uh, for Cardiff. I, I apologise. Uh, that sees them right back up in the mix, mm-hmm. and then also. Sheffield with two victories, one against us, of course, that we've already talked about, and then another victory in Fife on Sunday. We'll move on to a, an incident from that game very, very shortly. Uh, but the, to look at the table, Brayhead, top, 31 points from 22 games. Sheffield, second, 31 points from 21 games. Panthers, third, 30 points from 21. Cardiff, fourth, 27 from 21. And then Belfast, surprisingly, in fifth. 25 from 20 and that's sort of your top five and now there's you mentioned how close it was at the bottom six seven eighth and ninth one point between yeah. all of them coventry and edinburgh on 19 hull and five on 18 and as we mentioned dundee at the bottom on 11 so incredibly close league this year yeah i mean we've talked about it haven't we on, on previous um and like i just said it's not just at the top of the table it's 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 right the way through sadly down to ninth but you know let's hope Dundee can kind of get back in so every everybody's kind of in that fight but you know I'll say it again I think it's just going to be one of those seasons you Mm. know every every weekend there'll be ups there'll be downs you know you'll be wanting to get four points as you always will but I think it's kind of for me and this is for every team you know it's not just for for the Panthers or the people at the top it's consistency Exactly. exactly you know that that will get you to where you want to be. If you're consistent, then I think you're going to be there or thereabouts. Other bits of news uh, since the weekend. Jay Tulip has uh, left the Steelers to go to Sweden, so they'll no doubt be looking for another forward. And no doubt their fans will be looking at you know, who's left the <laughs> NHL recently because they're realistic like that. Uh, and, of course, there have also been some DOPS reviews uh, over the past couple of days. So, to list them all out, Matt Nickerson of the Five Flyers, four games for an incident in the game against Sheffield on Sunday. Tyson Marsh has received one game for a check from behind on Daryl Lloyd in Sunday's game in Cardiff. And then Omar Pasha, the Hall coach, received two games for throwing some water bottles onto the ice on Sunday. So, uh, where do you want to start with those? Let's start from the the you know the last one and work our way back again. So okay, let's start so with Omar Pasha, Pasha. Two games. <laughs> I thought that was harsh, very harsh. I mean, okay, you can't abuse an official and you can't throw things onto the ice. I get that, but two mm. games for that when you consider that Dow got nothing for a check to the head and Marsh gets one game for a, for a, ch- a dangerous check from behind. Yeah, it's a weird one for me. Fair enough. If you know you punish, you, you make a punishment for the misconduct, but two games seriously. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that, that's yeah. a weird one for me. I can't, I can't work that one out. And you know, let's let's pretty much take it on to the Tyson Marsh. You know, he got one game for the checking from behind. I, think I don't, can, I don't, which is fair enough. But I don't fully understand how a checking from behind, where you can physically injure a player, is not as bad, or according to cops, isn't as bad as being rude to a to an official and chucking having a little paddy. Mm. 
I mean, uh, weird the, one. the Tyson Marshall one for me is fair enough because because he, he does completely lay Daryl Lloyd down, and, and yeah. whatever you say about Daryl Lloyd, and he's not well liked outside of Belfast. But you don't yeah. wish injury on, on on a guy, and he's he it was a bad hit for me. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't think he's got any any defence to be honest. Um, yeah, we all love to hate Daryl Lloyd, don't we? Um, but you don't wish an injury on anybody. Um, I feel that was the right call, but uh, it just you know highlights how dodgy I think the Pasha call is. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, we've got uh, Matt Nickerson. Four games for an incident <laughs> against Sheffield Steelers where, um, to be fair, you know he deserved a match penalty. He deserved some sort of ban. I agree with that. Whether it was four games, I'm not so sure. What's your thoughts on that one? I, I think it's fair. Mm. I, I think four games is fair. I mean, if you take everything into consideration, you know, he skates down the ice to the other end. Um, Eddie, you know, isn't really doing much. He's kind of on the on the outside of the main fracas that's going on, and Nixon why? just kind of comes in and steamrollers yeah, into the Yeah, I mean, one, th- one thing I want to point: why does Cullen Eddie always seem so angry? Every game I've seen this season involving the series, he just looks angry. He goes goes around like just yapping at people. <laughs> is, it, is it because his parents got his name the wrong way round on the birth certificate or something? He's, he's just old a grudge this long. He, he just looks angry. He's an angry, angry man. Calm down, Cullen. Calm down. Well, you know, maybe <laughs> maybe he needs to take a you know a leaf out of Henley's book and get some crayons and do some colouring. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but you know, for Nickerson, you know, he steamrollers him to the floor, and then I'm sorry. He, he goes in and don't, punches you him. You don't punch somebody mm-hmm. when they're on the floor, pretty much defenceless so for me you could possibly say, you know that's kind of gone towards the ban and then Nixon doesn't do himself any favours because he's still yapping still trying to grab Steelers throws a you know a bit of a punch over a linesman it's just not clever mm. from Nickerson and I, I personally think four games is is justified it it, it didn't help the f- the flyers in that game, and it, it it didn't help them in last night's game against us, and it won't help them coming into the weekend either. Because whether you like him or or don't, Nickerson is an important player for them. Yeah, and the thing is with Nickerson when he when he channels his aggression, as we all as people talk about enforcers and stuff like that, when he actually plays but then defends his team when needed, he's fantastic for the Flyers. Well, we, we saw that in that, that victory that Flyers had at the NIC earlier yeah. in the season, where he, he he bossed the game, basically. Yeah, exactly. But then when he does stuff like he did against the Steelers, it's just it kind of makes you say, well, why do you need an enforcer? OK, uh, we shall leave the weekend there, and we shall move on. Earlier this week, I got the chance to speak to former Panthers defenceman Brock Wilson. It's a great interview, 16 minutes long. We talk about a lot of things, including Jordan Fox, uh, his grandfather, Wink Wilson, of course, former Panthers player from the 50s, and also what Brock himself is up to now. Delighted to welcome to the Cats Whiskers TV podcast uh, a man who we've been hoping to get on the show for a few weeks now, and he's agreed to come on, and we're delighted to have him. It's Brock Wilson. How are you? I'm doing very well, very well. How are you? Yeah, very good, thank you. Uh, as I said, appreciate you uh, coming on and spending some time talking to former fans here in Nottingham. No, it's been great. It's been uh, it, I'm, I've been looking forward to this, and you know, like I said, I, I miss my time over there, and it's 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 been hard being away from everybody. You know, it's it's one of those things where you know I'm always keeping up and, and seeing how everybody's doing, and, and I stay in touch with a lot of the fan base over there, and it's you know it's one of those things that I'll never forget. It, the time over there for even just that year was so so special to me, and it's like I said, it's something that you know just touches you in a way that you never thought would. Uh, there's a lot of good relationships, and, and like I said, with people I still keep in contact with, you for instance, and and on just a lot of good people over there, and it's you know it's it's true to testament to that fan base and and how special they make the players feel. It's clear you've got a great affection for Nottingham and the Panthers. What was it about your time here that had such a lasting effect on you? It was the people. 
it's 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 just a, it's a big family over there and how much they care about the players and the team and the organization it's it's something you just it, it, the second you get over there you feel it you know from the first practice when Jordy and I stepped on the ice to you know how many people were there and you know how involved the players are with you know all the different events that had they have going on and it's just amazing to see how much the fans over there care and it's it's totally different from the north american you know fan base and it's it's a genuine care for the team and they feel like they're a part of it and the players make them feel like they're a part of it it's it's honestly it's just amazing to see you you played in the same team as your cousin jordan fox now i know you guys are very very close how much did it mean to you to actually play on the same roster as him it it was amazing, um, and and to do as well as we did was was something special. And like I said, over that summer, I was kind of uh, unsure about what I wanted to do. You know, I still didn't know if I wanted to give it another shot and try and play in the American League and move my way up. But you know, Jordy and I just sat around, and and I just you know, I think it was his wedding, and we were at his wedding, and just kind of sitting there and watching him, and just you know what, just thinking to myself. You know, I think I want to give this one more last shot, and I think I want to do it with my cousin. And like I said, him and I have been very, very close from the you know from the day we were both born. And you know, it was just something I wanted to share with him, and and I probably knew it was going to be my last year. Um, and so I wanted to do it with him and, and try and do something special. And like I said, it, I I had never looked back. It was one of the most amazing experiences in my life, and I don't regret it for one bit. Of course, you was using a team that won the Challenge Cup and also the playoffs. You know, it seemed to be a, a very, very good side that season, um, but obviously missed out on the league. But a special season for you. Yeah, you know what? The, there was some good competition. Like I said, I think uh, you know Belfast had a heck of a team, and they just worked, and they were a little bit more consistent than we were. And it, you know, you never realize how hard it is to win over there, and and, and you know, with all the emphasis on the league championship, it's. You know, it's amazing to see, and, and like I said, they just had a better squad that year, and, and we had a few bumps in the road, and it, it ended up costing us. But, you know, like I said, you know, it was amazing to do what we did, you know, winning the playoff championship and the, and the Challenge Cup was, an, you know, it was a special experience for me because it had been a long time since I, I'd won something. I was on some good teams, and we just couldn't seem to pull it together. But, you know, like I said, it's, it's something I'll never, ever look back, and I, it took so much with me from that, and, you know, it was an amazing experience. Hmm. Of course, we, we, we talked about your, your relationship with your cousin Jordan. There's a history of hockey players throughout your family. Obviously, Wink played for the Panthers in the 1950s. Your father, Rick, was in the NHL with the St. Louis Blues. With that history of, of hockey in your family, was there really any other career path for you? <laughs> no, it was tough. I was I was pretty much born into it. I, like I said, I love playing baseball, but you know everybody in my family played hockey, and I just kind of played baseball for a few years, and I just realized, you know what, this is this is not. I didn't like the hot summers. I liked being in the cold, and that was pretty much the decision for me. I didn't I didn't like the hot summers, so I ended up you know choosing hockey, and, and I never looked back. It was. Uh, you know, it was, it was something special, you know, to grow up, watch my dad play and, and to kind of remember that. And it's an amazing background that we have. And we have a lot of talented hockey players in our family, you know, and looking down at my cousins now, my cousin's playing junior hockey in the USHL, which is an amazing feat for him. He just scored his second goal of his, of his season. And, you know, it's just amazing to see. And it's, it's true testament to our hockey bloodlines. And, you know, it's, uh, I never made it to the NHL like my father, but, you know, I built some amazing memories and some amazing friendships. And, you know, I, I still, you know, I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing now, but, you know, it's, it's amazing to see how, how much the bloodlines affect you and, and what it has to do for you. Of course, with your dad playing over 250 games in the NHL, did that put any pressure on you throughout your career? It really, it really didn't. He never, he never once really pressured me into playing hockey. He was always one of those guys that stood off to the sidelines. And you see a lot of these kids and, and guys whose fathers played in the NHL and they're heavily involved with, you know, moving their sons on. And I'm not saying that, you know, it's the reason that they move on, but, you know, my dad really just kind of let me do my own thing and let me kind of figure it out for myself. And, and I can sit back and say, you know what? I really did this on my own. You know, I played college hockey and I moved on to the pros and it was one thing that, you know, I really take pride in is, is I really did this whole thing on my own and I made it that far. And, you know, it's a lot of, you know, it's, it's something that not a lot of guys can say. So it's, you know, it's been amazing for me and I really appreciate the way he let me find my own way in this. And it was pretty special to me. Because we mentioned your, your grandfather, Wink, he played for the Panthers in the 1950s, as we said, and made quite an impression when he came over to Nottingham while you and Jordan were playing for the team. I understand he's not so well at the moment, so how's he doing? Um, he's he's really struggling right now, and, and it's tough to, you know, to kind of, tell, you know, let everybody know, but, um, you know, Wink's, Wink's a legend in his own mind and everybody <laughs> else's mind. 
He's uh, he's not doing so well. Um, I think that his time's almost coming to an end. I think that he's not, you know, he's not happy with where he's at, and he's struggling a little bit. And I think that he's ready to kind of just move on to the next phase of of you know life, and you know, move on. And um, you know, it's it's really hard on on the family because he was he's been such a big part of my life. You know, my whole hockey career, he's been there for me, for my cousin, and everything. You know, when I was playing junior hockey in, in Canada, I mean, he they drove through snow, 10 feet of snow to, to make it to my games, and you know, he's just been so supportive throughout our entire lives, and you know, it's hard to lose somebody like that, and it's hard to see him go through something like this, but you know, it's a part of life, and um, you know, as much as it hurts, uh, I just want to kind of see him, you know, not to have to deal with the pain anymore and be happy, and you know, it's it's tough, but you know, we appreciate everybody's support over there, and hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully his, his misery ends here for him. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's really sad to hear, because I say, I, I, I met him when you was over, and just, what a great guy, absolute great guy. Um, yeah. So, it's really, really sad to hear, to hear that. Just moving on now to your current role, because you're working within the St. Louis Blues development system. Yeah, I'm, I'm working with uh, the amateur, uh, the AAA program here. I work with uh, 16 and 15 year old kids. Uh, I'm coaching them, and I do their strength and conditioning off ice. And you know, like I said, we d- I actually did a, an interview for the you know the challenge or was it the playoff championship? And they asked me what I want to do after hockey, and while well, I'm doing exactly what I want to do. And you know, working with these kids has been absolutely amazing for me. It's it's been um, it's been a great last two years, and then this year it's been a little bit of a roller coaster ride, but. Uh, you know, it's it's amazing to see these kids achieve their dreams and for me to be a part of that, you know, whether it be get drafted to the USHL, we have a bunch of kids making it, you know, playing in the USH or US Day development program. Um, you know, I'm gonna have some kids draft in the NHL probably this year and it's it's amazing to see them grow as people on and off the ice and, and to be able to, to have some sort of influence and to be a part of that is it, it it beats everything I ever did playing hockey. It's just amazing to see these kids do what they're doing and be able to help them achieve their dreams. Mm. I mean, development is is a real hot topic in UK hockey at the moment, as you may have heard. Um, while obviously there is certainly more of a hockey culture within North America, is there anything that you do in your system that could be easily implemented in Britain? You know what? It's it's like I said. It's just you're getting more coaches involved and people who know what they're doing and people who love what they're doing, not just that they're there just to be there. Um, you know, the USA Hockey Program is is the, and implemented like this. Um, you know, this, this individual skill program, which has really helped out what they're doing. And, you know, like I said, it's just getting more people involved that love the game than understand it, you know, and, and that's what I think the UK needs to do is just get more people involved, get the knowledge out there, um, build more of a, or of a base in UK hockey and, and show how great the program's doing. Because the reality is that, you know, the IHL, you know, the league over there has just been amazing. And, and for me to see how well it's been blossoming and the, you know, the, the quality of play is, is amazing to see and they need to you know market that and, and show these people that hey this is a great sport there's a lot of people involved and you know players like david clark lakovich there's a lot of great players over there and, and they need to you know showcase them and show that hey this is a great sport and there's what needs to be more people involved and it starts with the coaching and you know implementing skill work and all that stuff did it surprise you uh, the quality of british players when you was playing over here it really did um you know, watching these kids and like I said, the Lakovich's and the Myers and all these guys and David Clark. I mean, David Clark is one of the best goal scorers I've seen. He's a pure sniper. And it's a testament to where he's at and, and where the league's at. It's it's amazing to see. I mean, it caught me off guard. I mean, the reality is, is you don't know what to expect when you come over there. And to see how classy these players are and how great of guys they are off the ice and what they can do on the ice, it, it really is amazing to see. I mean, it it definitely caught me off guard and surprised me. But, you know, the, the more the season went on, it was just, you know, I love to sit back and watch them play and, and realize you know the potential that they have and where they're at you're saying now that you've got kids in your system that will probably be drafted in the nhl what's the ultimate ambition for you now you're a coach would you like to try a, to be an nhl coach or, or are you happy staying within the development system I'm I'm really happy where I'm at. You know, the NHL is a, it's a long step away, and you know it, it takes a lot of sacrifice. And what I have here in St. Louis is, you know, building this gym that my dad and I run, and and how well it's been doing. So, at some point, I'm going to have to make a decision. Do I do I go back and and you know try and work in the USHL and and you know coach there and 
and leave here. I mean, it's, it's a really been hard for me. I mean, I'm trying to, you know, find my way and, and decide on really what I want to do. Do I want to, you know, continue with the gym here and coach the, the young guys here? Or do I want to try and improve my career and move on up the ladder? And, you know, it's something I've been going through and, and, you know, contemplating every day. I'm scouting in the USHL now for Sioux City Musketeers. And, you know, that's been, it's been really exciting for me to do. It's, it's kind of shown me some different ropes and, and different ways of, you know, I never thought that I'd be sitting there one day and scouting for the USHL and, and running into all guys that I played with and co guys who coach me. It, it's been pretty funny to do, but you know, like I said, it's it, life. You know, you're trying to just kind of find your way and decide what you want to do. And you know, somewhere down the road here, I think that you know I'll figure it out. But for right now, I'm I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing. In hockey terms, you're still quite a young guy because you're only 30 years old. Yeah. And I suppose you, it could be said you retired after you finished playing for the Panthers, but you had a, a short spell with Missouri Mavericks and then another short spell with St. Charles Chill last yeah. season. Have you ever thought about going back to pro hockey uh, in a playing sense, or or is that it for you now? No, that was it. Um, you know, the reality was is there were two teams that kind of needed some help, and I just kind of did it as a favor. I, you know, I wasn't really exactly happy playing, but, uh, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, I was like, why not? You know, I had a weekend off or, you know, this weekend off and next weekend off. So I was like, you know, I might as well just kind of jump back and play. And, you know, it really reassured me that I am happy being retired. <laughs> I'm not, I am not into that life anymore. That's not what I want. So it was kind of a reassurance thing to say, hey, you did. You made the right decision by retiring. So. We've got a few questions that we we got on Twitter from fans. If you if you're happy to answer them, yeah, definitely. Okay, first one from Tana Crawford, and you may have uh, probably already answered this, but do you miss playing professional hockey, or is coaching as fulfilling? Coaching is fulfilling. Um, I do. You know, the biggest thing I miss in professional hockey is the relationship that you build with the fans and the players, and. Um, you know, it's a different style than the relationships that I have with these kids. You know, the, the interaction with the fan base and, you know, kind of like the spotlight a little bit, um, that was really fun. And and that is one thing I do miss. I don't necessarily miss playing, but I do miss, you know, the interactions that you have with fans. And that that's the biggest thing for me. Sam Johnson says, how close have you and Jordan been to returning to the club since you left? You know, we talk about it all the time. And the reality is I would love to come back at some point. And like you said, when we're talking about coaching and all this stuff, you know, at some point I really would love to come back over there and coach and, and be involved at some at some one way or another. And, you know, I know Jordy misses it too. Um, and if we could both end up coming over there, great. Like I said, at, at some point I definitely want to come back over there and be involved with the club somehow. Because Jordan's not got a club at the moment, I'm right in saying, not to. No, he's, uh, he's actually working for my Uncle Dave. Um, he's doing extremely well. He's, he's really um, kind of he's doing some sales with my Uncle Dave. He owns a company here in St. Louis. It's called Document Network Technologies. And Jordy, you know, like I said, Jordy will do great at anything he wants um, mm-hmm. when he puts his mind to it. And uh, he's really taken off. He, he loves the people at work, love him. Um, he's got a personality about him where everybody wants to be around him. And he's really thrived in that environment. And uh, he's done really well for himself. So is, is is that it for pro hockey for Jordan? Then, do you think? Yeah, yeah, I, th- I think that he's done in that manner. Um, he's actually been talking to me and trying to find ways to get involved in coaching right now and get a cert- certification. So I think he's going to get kind of jump on board. You know, when he has time right now, it's tough for him. But, uh, you know, like I said, he'll he'll get involved in some way, one way or another. And one final question coming from, from Nick Walker, and, and keep it as clean as you possibly can, yeah. but what, what is your, the, the funniest story from your time at the Panthers? Oh, and you know how hard that is. You know, it was, um, we had a really, we had an awesome time. I think one of the funniest things one night was uh, Matthew Myers, uh, he, he had a, he had a Halloween party and just to see some of the costumes, you know, I can't necessarily say some of the costumes, but that was probably one of the funniest nights is walking into his place and seeing everybody from Corey, all these guys showing up in their different costumes, you know, from, from Simon to, to Matthew to, you know, Danny, everybody. It was, that was one of you know, the funniest nights of my life. You know, we ended up at the casino and, you know, you know how that works out. Mm. So we, we really had a great time over there. We had one heck of a group, you know, every day why we something was funny so you know i'll never i'll never forget that year from everything you know from the group of guys that we had to the fan base we just really made it was really enjoyable okay bro i really want to thank you for your time really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show and wish you the very best of luck with the rest of your career 
Thank you. No, I, I really appreciate it. Like I said, I, I want to you know have a message to all those fans out there. I really, really appreciate your support through Wink and, and for everything. Um, you know, it'll never be forgotten in my heart. You know, It's a lasting memory that being over there that year was one of the best times of my life. And like I said, I'll never, ever forget it. And I'll never, ever deny anybody the relationship of reaching out to them. And, and you know, I really appreciate everything that everybody did for us. Many thanks to Brock Wilson for taking the time to speak to me earlier this week. Aaron, not great to hear how his grandfather's doing. I, I, managed, I met Wink when he came to Nottingham uh, when both Brock and Jordan were playing for the Panthers, as I said in the interview. Uh, really nice guy, top, top guy, and, and it's such a shame to hear that he's suffering. Yeah, it, it is. It's terrible. I mean, Wink was a man... Uh, I, did, I obviously I didn't know him personally, but you know you just can tell that the guy loved hockey. He loved, you know, he loved the Panthers as well, and that history of him playing for the Panthers, and then and then Brock and and obviously Foxy playing for us. It's very sad to hear, and you know we obviously just the the whole of the Panthers nation. I'm pretty sure would send their send their love and wishes to to Wink and and Brock, and just let's just hope that uh, you know, it's horrible to say, but like Brock says that you know he doesn't have to suffer for a long time and you know we just all send uh, send our love and wishes yeah absolutely absolutely of course another revelation that that came from from there is about Jordan Fox he seems to have found another career yeah I mean what are you doing to us Foxy we all had hope <laughs> didn't we um, <laughs> yeah, see a lot of people will be yeah, pretty, de- pretty devastated by that news yeah but yeah good luck to him I say there's no doubt and nobody can question what Foxy did for us while he was here. We'd all would have loved to have seen him pull on the jersey again and you know, we, we can all dream but it doesn't sound like that's 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 gonna be a uh, a thing coming soon. But you know, we wish him well. Um he's a big part of our history and um you know him and Brock, and how great was it to hear from Brock and and, and hear that's you know hear him talk about his thing with the Panthers and like Brock says it would be a, it would be great to see him back here in some sort of job one day. So uh, we look forward to that, Brock. But you know, just from my point of view as part of the Cats Whiskers, thank you very much to Brock for doing the interview. Um, it was it was great to hear the stories and everything. Yeah, absolutely, and I think I think that's for me. I think it's so nice to hear from from a former player who's got so much love for. for for Nottingham and the team, but also to hear how well he's doing for himself since since he left. So I think, yeah, yeah wish him every success for the future. Indeed, indeed, and it'll be good to see him over, like he says. Yeah, absolutely. Moving on then, uh, of course, Tuesday night, Panthers took on the Five Flyers in Fife in what looked a, a tricky Challenge Cup quarter-final tie, first leg. Mm-hmm. Didn't turn out that way, though. <laughs> no, it didn't really, did it? Um, very dominant performance from the Panthers. Solid from the word go. You know, you have to give credit to the Fife. They were probably, you'd say, edged the first period. But, I mean, a bit of a crazy ending, wasn't it, really? Yeah, that I mean, got... I mean, one one second left and a goal <laughs> scored. I mean, I, I missed the goal, sadly, because the webcast cut out for me at that time. But it just seemed a bit, you know, a bit weird because, obviously, then... It didn't get restarted. It was. It went straight into the into the other period. So well, very strange. The commentators on the webcast were saying, "Well, oh, has it been given? Has it has yeah. it been given?" And and it sort of went on for, for a minute. And I'm I was doing the uh, Panthers hockey live. I was just doing sort of goal and end of period updates. And I'm like sort of hanging like like, come on, let me know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so were many other people hanging on your word, Jono. But um, I mean, it was solid, solid though, wasn't it? Look, I, and I, t- I, t- I tweeted actually saying that I think those goals have been coming mm. you know and this is the flip side to people's argument isn't it that when when the goal scorers and when the whole team sort of provides goals then we will score goals because mm. we have them we have the goal scorers in our team so if they are hitting the back of the net then we are going to score goals I think difference on on Tuesday night was the fact that Benedict chipped in with I, th- I believe it's been accredited to him with a hat trick that's that's somebody that people have talked about that possibly hasn't hit the height so far so you know when you've got players like Benny Farmer providing the goals as well it automatically takes a lot of pressure off the Grahams the Lawrences but you know even they chipped in with goals as well but I think one thing for me from from watching the webcast is we looked we looked like we played with speed yeah and for me it's what we got told our team would be at the start of the season. Quick transitional play from defence to the forwards in, the, in, in, a, in a click. 
Mm. And, and I think, I think uh, yeah. Fife couldn't handle that. Yes, they were short, short benched. With all due respect to the Panthers, you can only put, you can only beat what's put out with you. Yeah, and I think for me, this is where where Evan Mosey is worth his weight in gold because he's so quick and his, mm-hmm. his transitional play is superb. I mean, I think like, he was playing on defence last night because we were short on, on defence with Mike Berube not playing. Yeah, and the move movements he was making from from bringing it out of defence, bringing it into attack, he set up so many mm. um, attacking plays for us. And as you you've already said, it was great to see players scoring goals, creating chances, and it it, it was an all round team performance. It was cl- it was clinical. Yeah, well, I think I text text you that didn't I? I, th- I think I said the word clinical, and you that's, know, that's thought... obviously where I've got it from. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> God, you could have credited me with it, please. Uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, I just thought we looked confident on the puck. We had plenty of movement. The puck movement was good. We cycled the puck well. Didn't take too long when deciding on our passes. We looked, we looked fluent. And you know, a lot of people were coming into this game were thinking, oh, you know, I mean, you could, you could, you even saw on social media sites and stuff, you know, oh, I'd take a one goal loss coming back to the NIC. Well. You know, we're going in there with five goals five plus. Goals, so yeah. you can't be complacent in that second leg. But of course you can't. I, I, I would say that the damage has already been done, and we've kind of got one and a half legs in the uh, in the semi final. But you know, just a just a fantastic performance. And we'll talk to the coach later about um, Belfast. But with us having a one game weekend, you don't want that to. You know, we want to be going into the Belfast game riding off the back of that Fife result because, you know, that's possibly one of the better performances from the Panthers this season. A complete performance, should I say. So it was very, very pleasing to see. And and I, I, for me, this is what this team can do. Of course, um, you know. there's a lot of people saying afterwards, good luck, Gary, in, in getting the crowd <laughs> in for the second leg. But of course, they've already said the second leg is going to be £10, £5 for concessions. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know we've got a five-goal lead, but it's a tenner. It's only yeah. a tenner to go and watch. You know, I I like to think they would still be a decent crowd turn up for that game. You would hope so, wouldn't you? Because let's be honest, the, the team have put the hard work in in the first leg, and you, you'd like to think that we'd then go and support them in the second leg. This is sport. Nothing is guaranteed. We, we've been in games before where where we've kind of been on the opposite side of this, and and we've been the team that have chasing chasing goals. You know, I remember back to obviously the clan in the playoffs. Not anything can kind of happen. I know they were always in our coming back in our barn, but you know, if I, it only takes a couple of goals from Fife in the first period, and people start getting edgy, and maybe maybe things happen. But look. I, I, I'm confident that we've done enough. I, I, I think we will progress to the semi-final. But yeah, it's a tenner, it's a fiver, like you say. Get down, support the lads. You know, reward them for that first leg performance with with being there in the second. And full credit to the Panthers, like we said when this got announced, they've done all they can really. Mm. You know, they've given us the opportunity. You know, yes, people have forked out a lot of money already, but you know, just I think the, I think the lads deserve deserve a decent decent crowd for that second leg yeah, couldn't agree more just one game for the Panthers this weekend and it's against the Belfast Giants at the NIC on Sunday with a 4pm face off delighted to welcome from the A View From The Bridge podcast our old friend Neil the coach Russell Hey, John. Hi mate how are you yeah I'm doing very well good good so before we move on to Sunday what happened at the weekend? <laughs> I will refer you to the View from the Bridge podcast. Um, I think my rant last night and Davy and Paddy's rant uh, would, <laughs> would uh, sum it up fairly well. I mean, we the Giants just just were not the usual Belfast Giants at all. You know, as I said uh, on the on the podcast last last night. You know, when you go into Cardiff and you guys know it as well as anyone. When you go into Cardiff, you know you're going to be physically engaged. You know you're going to have to take hits to make plays and. It just seemed that the well, it didn't seem. It just was fact that the Belfast Giants just just weren't willing to do that overall. You know, I mean, the Saturday night game, the Giants played okay. Um, you know, the four-one scoreline flattered Cardiff overall, and I think Cardiff would probably say that to you as well. I think uh, Killer mentioned it in his post game, but the Sunday night game, I mean, uh, the Giants, uh, the Giants just were not at it at, at all. Um, 
and got what we deserved, and that was a no point weekend, much to uh, much, much to the discontentment of the Belfast Giants fan base. You talk about um, playing a physical game in Cardiff, and of course you signed Kevin Westgarth a few weeks ago, mm. more or less direct from the NHL, and he he was a brought in to probably play that role, that tough man role, but it's something you've not really seen from him so far. No, and I think um, I think Steve Thornton hit the nail on the, on the head, speaking to Davey in, the, in his post-game interview uh, in Cardiff at the weekend. I mean, Belfast, we're a team that are actually built for the physical side of things. We've got big Cody Brookwell at the back with Davey Phillips on the back end, albeit he's, he's out with a facial injury at the minute. Up front, we've got Ray Sawada, we've got Kevin Westgarth, we've got Adam Keefe, we've got Daryl Lloyd. Guys who will all physically, or sorry, guys who should all physically engage. I mean, you guys know it as well as I do. Keefe and Lloyd will always, um, will always put their bodies on the line. But whenever you bring in somebody like Kevin Westgarth, I mean, the guy is a man mountain on skates. He has a huge physical presence. Um, he comes in with a fearsome reputation. I mean, you know, as as Todd Kelman uh, mentioned on the on uh, the Belfast podcast, the View from Bridge podcast last week, he's NHL tough. He is NHL tough, and guys won't necessarily want to fight him because he is that tough. Like, I mean, we we saw him ragdoll Tyson Marsh in Cardiff a, a month or so ago, and that's that's been his only real kind of physical confrontation so far since he's been here. My uh, Belfast fans um, don't like what they've seen so far. Um, I, I mean, when you bring someone in like that, um, Steve Thornton and the fan base will expect you to put your body on the line every night to to finish your checks, to um, if and when required, go and drop the gloves, uh, or certainly get in people's faces and put them intimidate them. If guys don't want to fight you, well, then at least at least be at them the whole time. Um, and he hasn't. He's playing. He's not playing tough enough, in my opinion. You know, and we saw Trevor Hendricks absolutely clean him, absolutely clean him along the board. Beautiful hip check. And big Kevin, you know, it's a good clean hit, but Kevin just got up and skated on and, uh, and what have you. I expect a wee bit more from Kevin Westgarth than I think all Belfast Giants fans do. He's been, so far been a bit of a disappointment. It has to be, uh, has to be said. I mean, that's one thing for me. You know, when you look at that weekend, you like like you said, coach. You know what you're going to get. Well, you know what you should expect from the Giants. Every mm. line is going to be physical. They're going to be in your face. They're going to finish their checks. And then you look at the Cardiff side that they've built there, and especially at home. You know, in the BBT, that you know, I was looking at that weekend as this is two you know physical teams that are going to get stuck into each other, and it's going to be kind of that that maybe decides you know who gets the points and maybe mm. you know as you say the fact that the Giants weren't on that just just you know gave it Cardiff well I I, I kind of said this on on the View from Bridge podcast last year talked about um us always having you know the best foot forward mentality you know being proactive as opposed to reactive and that was something that stood out for me last year with with our team and led us to fantastic success. We we, we were supposed to not bully boys, but like we were just constantly proactive. We got early leads. We we put teams under pressure. We had a lot of creativity, a lot of skill. Uh, and this season so far, it just you know, and we have had a lot of injuries. And I don't mean to sound like you guys this time last year. It's like deja vu. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but but I will. Um, well, you know, Thor- Thornton hasn't had it easy since he since he's taken over, guys. I mean, um, from right from the get go, um, the Giants have had two or three imports out on average per game, really, up until last weekend. To be honest with you, um, obviously with Stephen Murphy's long term injury, we had to bring in Carson Chubak in the goal, so we're actually playing at maximum capacity uh, of imports for the first time. Um, this season, just last weekend, there in Cardiff. So it, it, it's been strange, Aaron. You talk about the overall physicality, and you expect Belfast to bring that. Um, and I think that's the thing that has got under most Belfast Giants' skins, really, uh, over the last short while. I mean, you, you're used to seeing that from Belfast, and whenever you don't see it, um, it leads to fans kind of questioning overall effort levels from from, from the team. and. You know, yeah. I'm sure the guys like they're professionals. Nobody likes being critiqued, and nobody likes being criticised for your effort, whether it be in your own job or whether you know these guys that their job has been a professional hockey player. But that's kind of what's been labelled at them. And Steve Thornton was very clear. He called uh, called a few of the guys passengers last weekend, and that to me, if I was uh, on Steve Thornton's team, that that would hurt me. Um, to, yeah, to, you know, and would lead me to question: Am I am I one of those guys? Well, if 
you know, if you are, get your finger out. It's time to uh, time to rock and roll. Well, to be fair, as a coach, you don't just say that, do you? You know, you because that can work mm-hmm. one of two ways, can't it? Really, it can motivate, which I'm sure is why why Steve Thornton has said that. But like you say, as a player, you can't be happy with hearing that, and it's obviously a kick up the old, you know, Jaxi, isn't it? Really, and mm-hmm. you know, from your point of view, maybe that's what. Belfast need but I just want to ask a very quick question um, before obviously we talk about the Panthers is I said at the start of the season when Jono asked me about the Giants you know you've obviously you know you've re-signed a a big core of your team Mm -hmm. but they're also you know they're they're getting a little bit older you know that can obviously work very well because you know you know we saw it last season what they can bring and what what the capability is but do you think that maybe some of these people have kind of are in a comfy zone and they kind of feel that maybe they needed that kick that Thornton has possibly given them now or you know, I, can I, they hit the heights that they did last season? Well, on on early season showing, no. Um, but, uh, I mean, we all saw the quality of the of the Giants last season. Um, you know, we, we only had to change three players um, from last season. Jeffrey Swayze, Dustin Whitecotton and the very own Belfast Datsuk now living <laughs> across there in, uh, in Nottingham with you guys. Um, you know, and, and arguably we've maybe brought in better players. You know, I mean, Ray Sawada um, has been playing in the American leagues, obviously played, whatever, 12, 13 games in the show a couple of seasons ago as well for Dallas. I mean, brought in a, a few quality players. Mike Compton, like Mike Compton is, uh, honestly, watch out for him, number 17 on, on Sunday, is a quality, quality player. But, you know, in terms of age, we are an old older team. We're the oldest team in the elite league. Um, last year, we we spoke a million times about you know the veteran leadership and how important that is in a throughout the course of a season. Uh, and I would like to think that our veteran leadership now are kind of getting the guys together and saying, right, boys, you know, enough's enough here. From our perspective, we're we're not performing. It is time now to to kick in the gear because those guys only a matter of what six, seven or eight months ago were were flying high and lifting league trophies and uh, and what have you and playing some absolutely sublime hockey so it's going to be really interesting to, to see how the Belfast Giants kind of turn things around or if they can I mean you're quite right Steve Thornton is kind of laying the gauntlet out there you know whenever a coach calls a few of his players passengers you know that that is a massive wake up call to a few guys do you think you're missing AD? I did see one of your tweets. I think you were trying to wind I up did. my good. I think you were trying to wind up my good friend Patrick Smith. I don't know if you got a bite from him. Normally, no, he's not doing no. the trolling, but actually, I wasn't. I wasn't. On, I wasn't on the on the fishing line. Actually, <laughs> I was. I was asking a genuine question because it is a question I posed on Sunday evening after you lost in, in Cardiff again, mm. and um, a couple of Giants fans uh, I, I was in conversation with, and, and they were sort of agreeing. They said they think we think we actually do miss him. I suppose you can look at this uh, in a couple of ways. I mean, Steve Steve Thornton is an incredibly methodical man, a really methodical man. I like what Steve Thornton brings to the Belfast Giants organisation. He's taken on a broader role, the head of hockey operations role. Paul Eady is not that type of guy. Paul Eady is your coach. He comes mm. in and takes on board the coach. Steve Thornton um, has taken on a broader remit. But, you know... Steve Thornton was excellent with the Giants in his last time. I suppose the counter argument from some fans will be, yes, well, he has been in he, he left hockey four years ago to take up business, and you know he's been a, a an estate agent over in uh, Ottawa or wherever it is that he, he's from over in, in Canada for the last four years and hasn't been actively in the game. Um, but I, for one, I back Steve. I like what he brings. I mean, he hits and every sportsman should be the same but he really particularly hates losing um and he's he's incredibly analytical he'll, he'll go away and he'll review videotape and he'll he, he's not afraid to call guys out and i quite like that whereas paul Eddy, like I'm not saying he got lucky or we but we kind of did last year like we barely had an injury all of last season our lines were cemented in almost right from the get go they didn't change now towards the end of the season whenever uh, we weren't maybe as fluent as we'd been for 90% of the season. People started to kind of say, well, you need to mix up the lines a wee bit here, Paul. You know, you know, he's a, Jeffrey Swayze isn't as productive as he was 
over the previous three or four months. Um, so we had copped a wee bit of criticism towards the end of uh, of last season, but overall, uh, you know, I'm happy with with Steve Thornton. You know, I suppose Steve as well will maybe turn around and say, you know, when he was signed up um, to to come in as the head of hockey operations the vast majority of the squad had already been signed. I mean, I think Steve had to make three, he had to make three signings. All the rest were, were re-signed. So, you know, maybe, maybe next season, you know, I'm certainly not writing this season off or anything like it, but I would imagine maybe next year we might see a, uh, a, a real Steve Thornton team and he'll put his, uh, put his mark on it. Okay. I suppose we should talk about the match on Sunday. <laughs> so after t- talking about all that. But of course it, it is, a, a very, very big game, um, especially when you look at the positions in the league. Obviously, Belfast fifth, twenty-five points. Panthers third on thirty points. In the conference as well, both teams on fifteen points. However, Belfast having played four more conference games than the Panthers have, it's a massive, massive game. But it's, it's a huge game, and it. it... It really is for Belfast. I mean, you know, Steve has has alluded to this already. Like we've lost too many games already for this uh, for this time of year. Um, you know, and this weekend is absolutely. And we, all of the podcasts I listen to, yourself, I listen to you guys as you well know every single week, and we all we all talk on our own individual podcasts about oh, it's a massive weekend ahead because it really uh, this one really is for Belfast. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, whenever you come off a no point weekend. Yeah, and, go, and knowing the following weekend, you've got to go into the NIC. I mean, the NIC is probably the one hunting ground for the Belfast Giants since since we came into existence in the year 2000, where we probably don't have the greatest of records. It has been a difficult barn for the Giants to to go in and, and take those take those points. Uh, I know we had a bit of a hold over you maybe last year uh, on a on a few games, but I mean, it, it is an incredibly difficult place to go into. Um, but Steve Thornton's going to have the, uh, the guys completely fired up and ready to go. Yeah. Well, I mean, f- f- for me, it's, um, it's it's quite interesting because, you know, for the, from a Panthers' point of view, you know, it's a one-game weekend. From the from the Giants' point of view, you're obviously in Hull on Saturday night. So, I mean, I don't know whether that could bring more misery coming into Sunday or it could, it could at least get you back on track Um coming into Sunday. So I think I think the Panthers have got to be very wary, you know. I Giant, Giants are tough anyway, but when they've been, you know, wounded quite severely as they have been pre- on the previous weekend, we we need to make sure that we we don't give them any opportunity. Um I think it's I think it's I think it's just built to be a fantastic game. You know, you've got the Panthers which you know, we obviously lost to Sheffield as we discussed earlier, but going into the festive period, you want to get yourself on, you know, confidence. You want to get yourself on a winning streak if you can. Um, I, I even think little things like, you know, the teddy bear toss that we've got. I think that's going to add to the atmosphere. I think it's, you know, I believe it's 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 selling quite well. I think it's all there to be a real tough game and You're a disagree- real good game. You're disagreeing then with Mr. Bam. I read his very well articulated article earlier on that John put up on Twitter um, to do with the whole teddy bear toss. Well, I haven't <laughs> bought my teddy bear yet, but um, I'll have one. Don't you worry. I think Paul actually made a good point there, though, about how it could completely mm. kill momentum, um, especially in, in the situation if, say, Giants are two goals up, Panthers pull one back, and then a load of teddy bears are going to come onto the ice. The ice has got to be cleared. It it gives the Giants a chance to regroup. And no, okay, it's a hypothetical situation, mm. but it's something that could possibly happen. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I I I like that side of hockey, though. I have to say, because oh, yeah. to me, and that that's the side of hockey that I you rarely see in other sports, and I love that about our game. Uh, just those kind of wee nuances that uh, that hockey have. I love you look at whenever somebody passes away in hockey, you could see all the uh, the videos that are made for the likes of Pat Quinn and all the rest. Uh, you know, it's so emotional, and you you just see like people talk about it. The hockey family, uh, or as Hitchy would say, not that family in Sheffield, but you know the the <laughs> hockey family. Um, you know, and I love that about the sport. But you know, you're, you're quite right though. Um, it can be a momentum deadener for for a, a given team. There's no question about that. I also I also think Sunday is going to be, you know, it's going to be partly down to how the netminders perform. You know, obviously from our point of view, Modic has pretty much come in and been 
you know, just fantastic. Mm. And we can't really fault him for for much. You know, obviously, I, from what I know, you know, Chewbacca has come in for the for the Giants and you know followed in Murphy's footsteps and done a decent job for you. So I think they're going to be critical. But I kind of just feel that. It's one of those games where Keith is going to come out straight away. It wouldn't, you see, it wouldn't surprise me if we saw Keith, you know, be pretty much the first line straight away. Uh, 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 you know, with Thornton putting out there what he wants from his Giants team straight away. Um, but I, I, in one way as well, you know, when we look back to the last game that the Giants came here, you know, we kind of gifted them a point in that because, uh, and I. I don't fear Belfast currently as much as I feared them last season. I know that's obvious to say when you look at, you know, the results that they've had and stuff, but they're just a di- different kettle of fish this, yeah, this season for me. Um, and I, like the coaches said, they've not always been successful in the NIC. So I, I think we should be going in there confident. We should, you know, it's a one game weekend. Like I said, they haven't always worked out well for us in the past. Um, so we need to make sure that we hit the ground running. Um, but I think it's going to be an absolute cracking game. And I think, you know, people that are attending, get to your seats early because I think you're going to see something special. I, I couldn't agree more with regards to uh, Thornton's philosophy. And you can be absolutely rest assured, I would nearly bet the mortgage on it, that uh, you will find <laughs> that Adam Keefe and Daryl Lloyd will be out uh, right from the get-go. Uh, I mean, that line... Um, Mike Compton has been right up there with uh, with our best player so far. He had, he had about a month out injured, but uh, he's been back in, and he is superb. And he's now centering that third line. Now you would automatically assume Mike Compton should be centering uh, the top line. Well, see, currently, Adam Keefe and Daryl Lloyd are arguably our best yeah. players. So they are. Yeah. Um, they have been absolutely superb all season long. And uh, again, Thornton has said on a few occasions he needs some of the uh, more whatever you want to call it the more established players your former NHLers and the likes of Sawada Wes Garth and maybe some of your more skillful players to kind of take note of of the work rate that uh, that those two guys put in night in night out and you can be rest assured you'll start with that line on, Saturday, on Sunday night so coach will you be taking advantage of the webcast oh no no sorry don't um, do uh, not get me st- <laughs> oh John oh John oh John oh <laughs> Why did I, you have to um, oh, the, uh, we've got another 10 minutes coming up. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> it no. is a massive... I, I will never understand why... And I have had this out with your GM. <laughs> I will never understand why you guys do not... And it's not you guys. The Panthers organisation do not... Uh, e- even for selective games. Even for selective games. Like, Belfast, yeah, trust me. If you guys were to stick on a webcast this Sunday, I would easily say you would have... A minimum of 600 viewers. Time's up by eight pounds. Thank you very much. There's Corey Nielsen's weekly wage. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I totally agree. But uh, obviously we we don't. And uh, well, will we'll, we'll see one? We'll have to wait and see. If if you want to, a hockey fix this Sunday, I would recommend getting down to the NIC. Uh, good seats are still available, I believe. But, All right, uh, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> But obviously, it is, go- <laughs> it is going to be a cracking game, I, w- I think. And I, I think we get- need to get as big a crowd as possible in the I, NIC I on Sunday. I'm sorry, Jono. Like I said, I, I, I would get there early. I think, I think the atmosphere from the get-go is going to, be, going to be special. And I think you'll see something special as well. OK. Well, Coach, thanks very much for joining us once again. Jono, Aaron, always a pleasure. Speak to you soon, guys. Thanks, Cheers. Coach. Thanks, Coach. Well, that is it for this week. Uh, thanks very much for joining us once again, and many thanks also to Brock Wilson for taking the time to speak to us, and of course, Neil, the coach, Russell. Uh, we will see you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>